Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. There was relatively little interest in Bible prophecy in 1969. There were a few good books on the subject, but they were written by scholars for seminary students. Most ordinary folks couldn't understand them. No one even considered the idea of writing a book on prophecy that the man on the street could understand and take interest in. Outside a seminary bookstore, even Christians were unlikely to stumble across the works of such prophecy scholars as Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. John Walvoord, or Sir Robert Anderson, to name a few. Therefore, Bible prophecy was considered mostly academic, the study of a technical theme known as eschatology. It was discussed in seminaries, not coffee shops. When I wrote The Late Great Planet Earth, it was my desire to write a book on the Bible's prophecies that would attract non-Christians and lead them to Christ. I also wanted to intrigue Christians and help them to understand the wonder of Bible prophecy. In that way, they might become excited about the hope of the Lord's soon return for the believers. To do this, I utilized global current events as they existed in 1969. Only three years before, I and the rest of the world witnessed the extraordinary fulfillment of prophecy as the combined might of the Arab world launched a war of annihilation against the young Jewish state. Israel was only 19 years old at that time. As I watched the well-equipped and trained armies of five Muslim countries prepare to attack, I knew from prophecy that they would not defeat Israel even though all the odds were with the Arab armies. Miraculously, Israel not only survived, but delivered a crushing defeat to her enemies. The Israelis captured East Jerusalem, biblical Judea and Samaria, the Golan Heights, Gaza, and all of the Sinai Peninsula to the Suez Canal. The prophet Ezekiel's predictions that the globally scattered Israelites would be miraculously restored as a nation and their ancient homeland in the last days were coming true before our very eyes. Even Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 37 verse 10 came true in the Six Day War of 1967. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. In December of 1969, a summit meeting was held at The Hague in the Netherlands. The heads of state of the members of the Western European Union confirmed their plans to push forward the political and economic unity envisioned in the European Economic Community. It was a fulfillment of the agreements contained in the Treaty of Rome. Also in 1969, China's veto seat as one of the permanent five on the United Nations Security Council was still occupied by what is now called Taiwan. But as I wrote back then, Red China is definitely on the road to becoming a great power. Today, that seat is occupied by Red China. 400 years earlier, the great scientist and philosopher, Sir Isaac Newton, himself a student of Bible prophecy, predicted the following. About the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Even so, there wasn't a lot of interest in Bible prophecy in 1969, but the sleepers were beginning to awaken. The first chapter of the late great planet Earth is entitled Future Tense. It focuses primarily on the then developing general interest in astrology and astrologers and the practice of divining the future. Even back then, there was a growing sense that time was beginning to run short. There was a sudden explosion of cults and cult leaders who rushed to capitalize on the vague sense of unease that was beginning to make itself felt. Over the ensuing decades, 
that sense of unease has taken on shape and form, if not substance. The secular world recognized it and, like the cults and cult leaders, sought to capitalize on it. One would think that that would result in people flocking to churches to get saved. Instead, movies like the Omen trilogy and Mad Max were among the first in an entire new genre of religiously inspired doomsday movies, like 2012. There are new doomsday theme movies coming out every season, desensitizing their audiences to the internal God-given warning bell that the clock is running out. In 1969, the foreseeable future didn't look all that rosy, but in 1969, there was a foreseeable future. In 1969, the U.S. national debt as a percentage of GDP was practically non-existent. America's credit rating was AAA, as it had always been. In 1969, what had college campuses stirred up was the Vietnam War and the military-industrial complex. At more than $350 billion, the U.S. national debt wasn't even on the radar. That was the national debt, not the deficit, which in 1969 was at 0%. Remember, the debt is the total amount we owe our creditors. The deficit is how much our bank account is currently overdrawn. Today, the year's deficit, that is how much we're overdrawn, stands at 1.4 trillion and counting. The national debt, that is how much we owe our creditors, works out to an average of more than $130,000 dollars per taxpayer. If you add in unfunded liabilities like Social Security, prescription drugs, and Medicare, it adds up to an unbelievable one million dollars per taxpayer. Don't take my word for this. Look it up for yourself at usdebtclock.org. Our current national debt at just over 98 percent of GDP, our gross domestic product, is about equal to our total national yearly income. The interest on the debt, which is the rough equivalent to paying the minimum payment on your credit cards, is now the fifth largest item in the federal budget. There's a passage in the book of Revelation detailing the ride of what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The third rider on a black horse carries a pair of balances or a weight scale in his hand. The author of the book, the Apostle John, hears a cry, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. This prophecy is still a bit future, but the stage is now being set as I speak. A quart of wheat or three quarts of barley are representative of a day's supply of food for a family. A denarius represents a day's wage in New Testament times. Oil and wine are symbols of great wealth. So what is predicted here is an economic situation in which it will take a day's wages for the average wage earner to buy a day's food for a small family. However, the rich will still be able to secure their gourmet food. This indicates that the shortage of food for the average person is not because of the lack of food supply, but because of a managed economic disaster. When the banking and investment houses began to fail in 2007 and 2008, the government covered all their losses with our money. That's what drove the current national deficit into the stratosphere. Now. The government is blaming the people to whom it gave your money for the economic tragedy unfolding on America's middle class. Regardless of the blame, the end result is clear. As the dollar erodes in value, everything will go up in price. 
Putting food on the table is already a growing problem among lower middle class families and soon the only ones able to buy the better foods will be the wealthy or the heads of new American Marxist proletariat. That is what the Apostle John had in mind when he wrote 2,000 years ago. It was still future in 1969. In 2006, Felipe Calderon was elected president of Mexico. He won the office on a law and an order platform. He promised to rid Mexico of the notorious drug cartels by militarizing the war against them. That allowed them to deploy the Mexican army in the struggle. The local police couldn't handle the job, and you can't really blame the typical Mexican police officer for resigning. Staying on the job means making a choice, plomo o plata, which means lead or silver. Roughly, that translates to take a bribe or take a bullet. Mexico's drug wars have claimed more than 40,000 lives in the last five years. That amounts to more casualties than any comparable period in any American war since World War II. The Global Commission on Drug Policy issued a report declaring unreservedly, the global war on drugs has failed. This criticism of the status quo was endorsed by three former Latin American presidents who organized the Blue Ribbon Panel. The head of Sinaloa drug cartel, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, was listed as one of the wealthiest men in the world by Forbes magazine. Another top member of the Sinaloa drug cartel, Zambada Niabla, cut a deal with the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. After being arrested in Mexico and extradited to the United States, Niabla told a federal court that he was granted carte blanche to continue to smuggle tons of illicit drugs into Chicago and the rest of the United States. In exchange for giving the DEA information on rival drug gang operations, the federal court indictment identified him as the logistical coordinator for the cartel, helping to oversee an operation that imported into the U.S. multi-ton quantities of cocaine using various means including, but not limited to, Boeing 747 cargo aircraft private aircraft, buses, rail cars, tractor trailers, and automobiles. According to Niabla's court filings, uh, the protection extended to the Sinaloa leadership included being informed by agents of the DEA that United States government agents and our Mexican authorities were conducting investigations near the home territories of cartel leaders so that the cartel leaders could take appropriate actions to evade investigators. While the DEA helped the Sinaloa leadership smuggle multi-tons of cocaine over the border, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, or ATF, with the DEA's assistance, helped the Sinaloa cartel smuggle guns back into Mexico for use against the Mexican and U.S. law enforcement officials. Nearly 200 of the weapons showed up at crime scenes in Mexico, and two semi-automatics were recovered after a U.S. Border Patrol agent was killed south of Tucson, Arizona. It's estimated that the 40-year-old war on drugs has already cost the United States roughly one trillion dollars. In 1969, I wrote in the late great planet Earth, look for drug addiction to permeate the U.S. and other free world countries. Drug addicts will run for high political offices and their drug history will actually win them support. Today, the war on drugs has hit a brick wall. There are but two remaining options that appear on the scene. Legalize drugs or eliminate cash. The strongest weapon for combating narco-terrorism, apart from legalizing narcotics, is the abolition of cash and its replacement with some kind of electronic currency. You see, eliminating cash and replacing it with digital money would end the drug trade almost overnight. By necessity, the drug trade is anonymous. 
Drug dealers don't take visa cards or bank cards for obvious reasons. Eliminate the anonymity from financial transactions and the Mexican Zetas or Sinaloa gangs would be instantly out of business. And it could be critical in tracking and controlling terrorist cells as well. It's a very attractive idea, despite the obvious pitfall. That is, whoever controls the central bank would control the global economy. But wait a minute. That isn't a very far cry from the current situation. Whoever controls the Federal Reserve already controls the global money supply. Indeed, replacing cash with some kind of an alternative form of legal tender is already under discussion in central banks worldwide. Cash is replaceable by electronic transactions. Electronic transfers are easily tracked and virtually impossible to hide. Electronic money would save millions in printing and handling costs by utilizing a currency that never wears out. And it would eliminate the underground economy. The theory is that it would wipe out the drug trade because there would be no easy way to pay for the drugs. Without currency, the motive for most forms of criminal activity would be eliminated. It is a great idea, one that especially makes sense today because the world will soon need to find a replacement benchmark currency to replace the U.S. dollar, which conveniently is at the present in a free fall. The one great danger is that such a system concentrates the power over the world's economy into the hands of a very few ultimately the Antichrist. The Apostle John predicts that just such a system will be set up during the tribulation. This will make it possible for the Antichrist to force total submission and worship to himself. You see, only those who worship him will receive a mark on the forehead or hand without which they can neither buy, sell, nor hold a job. Such an economic system will give the Antichrist total control over the population of the world. That would not be possible as long as the option of using anonymous cash still exists. So it's significant that the European leaders are pressing for changes including global standards for regulation and banking an early warning system within the International Monetary Fund for the world economy and a supervisory body for at least the world's 30 biggest banks. The proposal is for a kind of European Federal Reserve System with global authority. It has been on the front burner since the global markets collapsed in late 2008. It proposes eliminating the dollar and replacing it with some kind of IMF credit. According to the Bible, this system will come into existence and it will be controlled by the Antichrist, who will come to power in Rome and rule over the ten nation revived Roman Empire. I titled the last chapter in the late great planet Earth, Polishing the Crystal Ball. In it, I wrote, now I'm going to go into the lion's den. In that chapter, I made a number of predictions of my own based on what the Bible foretold and from the perspective of 1969. I said to expect unprecedented denominational mergers into religious conglomerates. In July 2011, an Episcopalian church in Maryland became the first U.S. church to merge with the Catholic Church. Secret negotiations between the senior Anglican bishops and the Vatican to merge the two denominations were revealed in 2008. In an official Vatican ruling, even married Anglican priests are invited to join the Catholic priesthood. I also warned back in 1969 that ministers would depart from the truths of the Bible by resorting to social action issues and gimmicks creating what I called super organizations. Now, there are lots of them, but instead, 
They're called megachurches. I also predicted an ever-widening gap between real Christians and so-called cultural Christians, that is, those who identify as Christian because they're not something else. A good example would be the atheist mass murderer from Norway, whom the media immediately labeled a fundamentalist Christian. Their goal was to draw a moral equivalency between Islamic terrorism and the so-called Christian terrorism. Of course, we've since learned that nothing in his history suggests any connection with real Christianity. In 1969, I wrote that open persecution will break out against real Christians. I wrote that Christians who believe in the final authority of the Bible, salvation through the substitutionary atonement of Christ alone, the deity of Jesus Christ, and so forth, will be branded as prime hindrances to society's lofty ideals like the universal brotherhood of man and such. This has all happened on schedule as born-again Christians have increasingly become marginalized in both the churches and the society in general. But now it has even gone to the next level. Starting with Janet Reno's Justice Department during the administration of Bill Clinton, being a Bible-believing born-again Christian can get you put on a watch list or even a no-fly list. Various attorney generals since Janet Reno have posted bulletins and flyers warning of the threat posed by born-again Christians. Driven by oppressive political correctness, even the U.S. military is growing increasingly hostile to expressions of Christianity within its ranks, even at the cemeteries. More and more public prayer and spiritual references are banned at government buildings sports events, on the campus, in the classroom, and in public places. An abusive and vocal minority have made it almost impossible for a public servant to utter a spiritual word without consequence. So what is the overall point? The point is this. When I wrote The Late Great Planet Earth, I believed that if these were truly the times of Christ's return, then what began as trends to v too vague to pinpoint in 1969 would continue to develop as Bible prophecy predicted they would. And they did. So how did I come up with all of this? Very simple. The Bible told me so. I want to remind you that for almost 50 years, I've said that because there is no such uh, an entity as the United States in Bible prophecy for the last days, I've said that it, somehow it's going to have to fall from being a world power. And I think we're seeing this happen right now. I pray, I try to say, Lord, please spare us and so forth. But with events happening that are happening right now, I believe that the United States will never again be what it used to be. Uh, certainly, the uh, kind of economic affluency that generally was in the United States, I believe those days are over. So we have to learn to do what we should have done in the first place, and that, that is put our confidence and our hope and our sense of security, not in a bank account or our jobs or anything else, but in the Lord and to claim his promises that he will take care of his own when the times get tough and to see as our hope not having uh, someday a larger home or a larger bank account or times will get better as they used to be but to look at the fact that very close now Christ is going to come for all of those who believe in him He's going to snatch us up to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So put your hope in the eternity and the things that God has promised. And if you don't know that you are in a personal relationship with the Lord right now, then you need to know that Jesus Christ died for you to purchase a pardon for you. And if you're willing to submit your life to him, and receive the gift of pardon that he gave you, then right then you're going to change your eternal destiny. 
that's what's the most important thing right now. And no matter what the cost, let's be verbal at declaring the only answer to life is to come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's it for tonight, folks. Thanks for listening. And God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.